I know everyone loves this idea of being able to do everything, Mm -hmm. but I think what people really actually like the idea of is being able to lift heavy things and look jacked like a bodybuilder, be able to do cool gymnastics tricks, also being enduring. And I think when most people go for those things as broad fitness, they're intentionally leaving a lot of other things out. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, your number one resource for all things fitness and performance in Switzerland. Today, I'm happy to welcome Evan Pycon back on the show. Hey, Evan, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good, man. So for those who don't know Evan yet, um, pause this, go back to episodes 14, 23, and 34, so you can know everything about Evan's background and we can roll right into today's podcast. So for today, Evan, I wanted to maybe have a little freer format than we usually have since we've kind of gone down the rabbit hole of dissecting energy systems together already. I I wanted to look for kind of questions around this. Uh, So first I wanted to know what questions that, uh, that you maybe had prior to finding NEARS and you thought, Oh, NEARS might help with this. What questions still remain for you uh, after all these years working with this technology and, and figuring things out and finding that new model of bioenergetic, what, what, what still, you know, what, what stone have you not been able to, to flip over yet and, and find the answer that you wanted? Yes. Yeah, so the one that's still really interesting to me right now is understanding the underlying physiology behind uh, critical power models. So mm-hmm. using something like a critical power calculation, we know the calculations work. We could use them for training. We could use them to predict time to fatigue and no one has any idea why they work. So it's one of those things where it's, that really bothers me because I don't only want tools that work. I want to understand why they work. And there hasn't really been a very convincing proposition put out there. And there's a lot of ongoing research on that topic specifically. So that's something I'm personally interested in. Um, I'm personally investing money into that research. So that's the thing that I... I'm pretty obsessed with right now. So for maybe those who are not familiar to kind of set the foundation for that, can you talk about a uh, critical, po- critical power model? Maybe there's people that do a lot of biking know that the, the FTP as well, uh, functional, uh, what is it? FTP functional threshold power, something yep. like this. Uh, yes. Can you talk about those different concepts, what they mean? And maybe uh, since you, you know a lot about those topics, where did those calculations come from in the first place? How did they emerge uh, without us maybe knowing? what actually happens physiologically. Yeah, so there's two different ways to calculate critical power. So we'll start with historically how it's been done and then a newer version of the test. So historically, the way that you would calculate critical power is we would take a fixed power output for you. Let's say your max wattage on a bike is 1,000 watts. We'll say, Sean, you're going to ride at 500 watts until complete failure. And you hop on the bike, you ride for 500 watts, and then five minutes and you fail. So then we'll say, okay, now you're going to do the same thing at 750 watts. And you're going to do that till failure. And then you're going to do it at 300 watts. And you do that till failure. So now we know when you were at 300, 500, and 750 watts, a fixed power output, how long could you sustain that effort until you fail? And then we plot that on a power duration curve. So power is on the y-axis. Time or duration is on the x-axis. And when we plot those three points, we could draw an asymptotic curve between them, like a linear regression. And what we would find is that at some point that curve is going to level out on that X axis of time. And there's going to be a power output that corresponds to it. So in theory, critical power would be, what is that power output that you could sustain indefinitely? Obviously there's no power output you could hold forever. In reality, most people can't actually hold their critical power um, for more than an hour or two hours but we would find that out. But what becomes even more interesting is if we know, for example, if your critical power is 200 watts, if we draw a horizontal line on that graph at 200 watts, and then we look at that critical power curve that we just plotted out, the area above the curve is going to be the same at all of those different distances that you did. So when you did 500 watts for max time, if we look at the area over the curve at that point for 500 watts, it's going to be the same area, 750 watts, and the same area as 200 watts. Mm-hmm. So the idea is that there's a fixed amount of work above critical power that we can do. 
and it's always the same fixed amount of work. So whether you're going really fast, and in that case, you exhaust that value very quickly, or you're going slower and you can sustain that for longer, and that value is called your W prime. There's another way to calculate critical power as well, which is god awful, and I don't wish this on my greatest enemies. Imagine you hop on a bike and we set a three minute timer. I'm gonna say, Sean, off the bat, when I say three, two, one, go, ramp the bike up as high as you humanly can and just try and sustain that as long as you can. So just riding a hundred percent effort for three minutes. That sounds like you'd imagine. Oh, awful. Like you'd imagine, you get a huge power output off the bat, and then you're going to have a huge drop off, and you're going to sustain a low value. Mm-hmm. You do the same thing, and you calculate a linear regression for that power curve, and you could also get your critical power. So you could pick your poison. Do you want to do the awful three minute test, or do you want to do three tests that aren't that bad? Mm-hmm. And I think we both know which of those would be less miserable. But either way, we're trying to come to the same conclusion. Well, it becomes interesting now is, well, what determines critical power? And then also what determines W prime? Because you could have two athletes with the same critical power value, but different amounts of W prime. So different amount of work that you could do above that value, Mm. or you could have different shapes of that power duration curve. And traditionally, when you look at the critical power research, people say, well, W prime is your anaerobic speed reserve. That's a popular term in track and field and endurance sports. Mm. Well, we both know with all the work we've done with NIRS, what the hell is an anaerobic speed reserve? Because right. everything is oxidative and everything is lactic. So that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So what I'm interested in understanding is, well, what determines these things? I think critical power is going to be very strongly linked to oxygen delivery. And there's a lot of really good evidence of that. But that W prime value is a little bit more elusive. And I think that's primarily linked to regional oxygen saturation of tissue. And I know you talked to Andre Feldman on here as well. He did a really good talk on this topic. Um, and this leads, the talk that he gave was for the 2020 MOXIE Summit. And he talked about work that he did on climbers with trying to calculate critical power, critical torque threshold. Um, but I think there's a lot of further studies that could be done on that topic to try and parse out what actually determines your critical power in W prime. And I think I want to take that concept one step further. And I think the reason why it's so difficult to model is that it's not one thing. I think it largely has to do with what your underlying physiological limitations are. Because in the calculation, we have regional oxygen saturation. That's easy to measure with the MOXIE. We have oxygen utilization. That's easy to measure. But we have that delivery component. Mm. Delivery is really tricky to measure because what is delivery? Is that your cardiac output? Is it stroke volume? Is it arterial oxygen saturation? So I think trying to parse some of those things out in different studies could give us more of a convergence of evidence to understand like what the hell is critical power. If you if you were to put a, a moxie on someone and tell them to ride, let's say on a bike, at their critical power, what would you practically see uh, from the SMO2 trend? So what that would likely be the highest intensity you could elicit where SMO2 is completely stable across the interval. Mm-hmm. So it just it would almost be like a maximal steady state in a way. Right. And then why why would someone fail after an hour or two if theoretically that is something you should be able to write out, you know, forever, let's say. Yes, yeah, so I think there's a lot of different factors that could go into this. Traditionally, they would say, oh, it's glycogen depletion is why you can't work at your critical power indefinitely. But I think that's actually very unlikely. Um, if you look at a lot of the contemporary literature on glycogen depletion, it's actually really difficult to deplete your muscle glycogen to the extent that I don't think I could personally do it if I tried my hardest. In one trial where they were actually able to get a pretty meaningful amount of glycogen depletion, they had people do a four-hour submaximal ride followed by six to 12 Wingate assessments, <laughs> which, yeah, I mean, that it's just absolutely absurd. So I think right. that's probably not a likely culprit. There's other things that could factor in as well. We know heat retention and heat dissipation, those actually do impact our ability to work um, at and above critical power. Mm. Oxygen delivery, if that is something that impacts it as well, it could either be the fatigue of our diaphragm and respiratory musculature. Um, It could be an inability to maintain cardiac output. And I think there's a way that we could actually parse these things out because one of these studies that has been done with climbers, and I'm actually in the process of trying to repeat this right now with cyclists, is creating a critical power time duration curve with people arterially occluded 
Mm-hmm. So if we know your max wattage on that bike is what we said before, imagine we cut off blood to the artery in your legs now and we have you do that same test mm-hmm. and we'll be able to look at the rate of change of oxygen in your muscles and plot that out on a chart. And what we find is that our predictive models are really good. But when you take off that cuff and you're not arterial occluded anymore, our predictive abilities actually get pretty poor. And because regional oxygen saturation, we know how much O2 is in the tissue. So that's the same in both conditions. We know oxygen utilization in both conditions. But the thing that the cuff does is it eliminates delivery from the denominator of that equation. But Mm -hmm. when you allow delivery to come back in, now the predictive models don't work. I think that's because delivery is so much more complex. It's arterial oxygen saturation. It is um, vascularization. It is cardiac output. It is stroke volume ejection fraction, so many things factor in. So when we're trying to ascribe that delivery variable in the denominator to one thing, our predictive models go out the window. But I think if we could get enough studies trying to isolate different things, you could get people breathing um, hypoxic gas mixtures to eliminate or to decrease arterial saturation, Mm -hmm. repeat trials in different scenarios. I think over time that will give us a better picture of what critical power is, how these mechanisms work. which maybe it doesn't give us anything new from a training standpoint because these models already work for training, but it would at least tell us why do these things work. And that could maybe open the door for other applications that we wouldn't have thought of otherwise. If, if we take the, the, few, the few variables that you mentioned, um, for example, stroke volume and then uh, fraction ejection, uh, for heart rate, I guess, plays into delivery as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, what out of those components, which ones are the easiest ones to measure and which ones are the really hard ones to measure or the ones we maybe can't measure and we have to try and get to them indirectly like you said by doing multiple tests with multiple you know o2 saturation values and then and then try to figure out in the middle where where those stand yeah i think the issue is less about what could we measure and what it's uh what is the cost of measuring these things and (laughs) That's why for a lot of these studies, I'm trying to partner with different universities to get these things funded because personally, I'm not going to go out and buy a physio flow for $20,000. So a lot of these things, stroke volume, we could measure heart rates easy. We could all do that at home, but stroke volume, cardiac output, getting these hemodynamic measurements are really difficult without one invasive and expensive equipment. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think being able to partner with different research institutions that have the funds to do that is going to help parse out a lot of these because I do have access to some lab equipment, but I can't answer all of these questions with what I have access to. So I think it's going to take a much more concerted effort to really get through these mechanisms. Do you think there might be some technology down the road, just like the Moxie brought down the cost of mirrors by like tenfold, 15 fold? Mm-hmm something that would do the same to tools that are now just very expensive and that you can't easily find? Yeah, uh, I would never say that it's never going to be possible. I don't know what that would be, but I mean, even if we look at the history of heart rate monitors, they used to be these giant devices that you strapped to yourself with wires everywhere. And now you could have one in a watch. And the same thing with a Moxie, even if we look at the Portamon from 15, 20 years ago, Portamons were freaking giants. And the Moxie is quite a bit smaller and about tenfold cheaper as well. Mm -hmm. So I think over time, just more and more technologies will be uh, accessible and affordable. But I think there has to be a demand for it for that to happen, which is largely the issue for something like um, getting hemodynamics accessible. The issue Mm -hmm. is that that would typically fall under the guise of a medical degrade device. And it costs millions of dollars to get something like that to market. Mm -hmm. So it would need to be branded as a consumer device to eliminate all the expensive testing to get the device validated but i don't think there's that big of a consumer market for people who want to measure stroke volume so (laughs) i just don't think the financials are there right now to make that um practical yeah that makes sense um i want to come back on something you mentioned a little bit previously in the conversation glycogen so we hear glucose all the time um can you elaborate a little bit on glycogen itself as you understand it today uh with the new, let's say the new model and and the role of glycogen in that, and maybe um, things that, you know, the average person might not know about muscle glycogen and its importance when it comes to uh, fueling everything that we do. 
Yes, yeah, so this gets into those contemporary models of bioenergetics. When I first learned about glycogen, I was interested in sports nutrition years back. It was kind of a second thought. You would be reading your book and you would talk about uh, glucose. Then I would briefly mention, hey, glycogen is this thing that gets stored intramuscular and outside of the muscle. And that's all we need to know about glycogen. Then we move on. But getting into these contemporary models of bioenergetics, it actually appears that glycogen is really important. And there's a few different reasons for that. One is that there's not a lot of um, glycolytic intermediates stored in our muscles. So there's just not a lot of um, intramuscular glucose available for energy transduction. So when we're getting through those models of bioenergetics and we need some form of sugars available, well, glycogen is the most ready candidate for that. And one of the reasons that we know that is if we look at a lot of the biochemical evidence, we see that glycogen phosphorylase could really rapidly increase its activity on demand. Mm -hmm. So we know that glycogen could be broken down and resynthesized on these millisecond time scales to provide energy for resynthesizing phosphocreatine, which is that it's like the bucket brigade of metabolism to resynthesize ATP. So glycogen has this really important role in all bioenergetic activities that we're doing. If they're lasting for more than a few seconds, we're actually depleting our muscle oxygen. Um, and then in terms of resynthesizing glycogen, that appears to happen on a much faster time scale than we previously believed and without the need for as high boluses of carbohydrates as we need. If you look at a lot of the glycogen depletion literature, you could have people do some nasty bouts of training, not eat any carbohydrates afterwards, and a day later their glycogen is resynthesized. And part of that has to do with the oxidation of lactate. I'm sure there's other mechanisms that tie into that as well. And lactate just gets into like a whole cluster of uh misconceptions i guess would be one way to say it yeah it's uh, i found it's a really interesting one lactate and actually all the roles that it does have uh in the body you were talking about you know even if you don't consume glucose you're gonna <clears throat> resynthesize your your glycogen the next day if, if correct me if i'm wrong but from george brooks 2020 paper on on lactate he talks about is it the quarry cycle where you can uh, essentially derive glucose from lactate uh, through the liver? Is that is that correct? Yeah. Was that the lactate is the fulcrum of metabolism paper? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, if even if you don't have any more glucose, you can make glucose with lactate, and then we make glycogen with glucose. And so, like like you said, the 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 lactate plays a a central role whether it's instantaneously in the energetic process, but also on the back end, if you need something else that's not available, lactate can probably kind of put it together for you in one way or another. Yeah, and a concept I was turned on to, I know you had Andre Feldman on recently. His father, Jörg Feldman, has put out tons and tons of content over the past um, decade or so. And the first time I'd gotten turned on to... I already knew that lactate wasn't a fatigue byproduct, but I'd never really considered things like cool downs, mm -hmm. cooling down. Like, why do we do it? I never really questioned it that much. I came up as a track and field athlete. So it's just something we did after our hard workouts and reading some of the things Jörg had written. He's like, okay, well, why do we do cool downs? Let's look back into the history of it. Well, the reason that we do active cool downs and active recovery after our hard training sessions is to clear lactate. At the time when these protocols were created, that was when lactate was still believed to be a fatigue byproduct or a poisonous metabolite. Mm -hmm. So of course, if you measure an athlete post-workout and then you have them do an active recovery and you see their lactate level is lower, you'd be like, victory, we got their lactate down, now they're gonna recover quicker. But the interesting thing is if you actually look at the applied sports science literature, active recoveries don't actually outperform passive recoveries. And in a lot of instances, you see that performance is greater the next day when you don't do an active recovery and muscle glycogen concentration is actually higher as well. Mm. This gets into that idea of, well, lactate is going to be oxidized to resynthesize glycogen. So if you're doing your active recovery specifically at a clear lactate, it's a little bit misguided and that doesn't mean that there's no value in an active recovery because maybe we want to do it to clear excess co2 but it opens the door for other possibilities of like may maybe for your cool down don't go for an easy jog lay down on your back and do breathing drills to try and offload excess co2 to clear that and leave mm -hmm. the lactate in circulation so it can be oxidized so i think it opens all kind of doors for different ways of um approaching training with methods that through a traditional lens you wouldn't really think make sense 
-hmm. but we never really go back and question these things like, oh, we both know lactate doesn't do what it's said to do, but I still cool down and I still have people cool down. So it's like maybe those are things that we could start questioning as well. And perhaps that actually is better performance outcomes. I don't know. Is it, to put it a little bit differently, is it that essentially, well, you accumulate lactate um, when you're, let's say, pushing a certain level of, of, of intensity on any given modality, you start accumulating lactate. And then if you do cool down, and I remember seeing that in one of Andrew's videos where he was talking about essentially the rest time between sprint bouts and the passive recovery folks had better performances on subsequent intervals uh, mm -hmm. than the active recovery ones. Is it simply that you're actually just essentially using more energy to, to do your cool down uh, mm -hmm. because you, the energy has to come from somewhere, right? It's, there's no, there's no free lunch. So even, on a cool down, even though the intensity is maybe, you know, 10%, 20% of what you did previously, it's still more work that you have to do compared to doing no work. So is it just that, hey, we're just essentially, which we're still pulling money out of the bank, but just a lot slower, but we're still pull, mm -hmm. pulling money out instead of trying to put it back in, which I guess just takes its own time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think this is what makes Moxie so nice. It's like with Moxie, we don't need to think about any of these things with lactate and getting into the fancy bioenergetics. Like we know muscle oxygen saturation is important for doing work. You could very clearly see if you're doing active recovery between work bouts that you're not restoring oxygen saturation to the muscle. So of course you're not going to do as much work. And this could mm. even factor into that critical power idea because we know that W prime, that work that you could do above critical power could be reconstituted. So it could recharge when you're actually operating under critical power. Okay. Well, if you're doing like sprint, completely rest, sprint, completely rest, rest, you could reconstitute your W prime. But if you're doing an active rest, you're running like a sprint and then jog, you might not be reconstituting that work that is finite as quickly so either way that you think about it in terms of lactate or critical power or just muscle oxygen saturation, all of those things would very clearly point to the fact that like, hey, maybe it doesn't really make sense to approach things that way. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned breathing before. Is that mm -hmm. something you recommend to all your athletes? Is it only kind of situational and depending on the context? Could you know, anybody benefit from some type of breathing cool down, maybe even in the warm up, depending on their needs? What, where do you stay on that? Yeah, so I think it could be useful for everyone if um, done appropriately, but I think a lot of athletes, because I primarily work with um, remote clients and a lot of my athletes are international, so I don't really have hands-on touches with them. There's always some athletes that tend to overcomplicate things quite a bit, and it could almost be to their detriment. So I've worked with um, a lot of athletes who are very talented and they just do things correctly automatically. But when you give them a cue or you tell them like manipulate your breathing in this way, it almost messes up their performance because they're thinking about too many things and it like throws a wrench in the gear. So for athletes like that, I usually just let them do their thing. I'm like, let's build the physiology in their training, take care of underlying limitations, mm -hmm. and then just let them like go and jam and like have at it. Other athletes that tend to be more receptive to feedback and don't um, get like paralysis by analysis, those are the ones that I tend to implement more of those things in their training. And then, of course, if I can get on-site access with someone, that allows us to implement a lot more than we could do remotely as well. And when you talk about cool down and maybe substituting some breathing for some active recovery, what type of, of uh, I guess, sequences of breathing do you usually recommend there? Is there kind of a, a standard that you go with or does that change from person to person? Yeah, I think that's going to change from person to person and session to session as well. So one of the examples that I was talking about before is if we're doing what I'd call like extended desaturation training. So a lot of volume in a deoxygenated state where we're almost eliciting a respiratory limitation. There's a lot of CO2 that hasn't been cleared. During the quote unquote cool down, I might give someone like hypocapnic breathing where they're intentionally breathing in a way that they're gonna breathe off too much CO2. So they're able to clear it. So they're gonna be taking really deep exhale or I guess you can't take a deep exhale. You're gonna be forcefully exhaling and taking deep inhales so you're breathing off that co2 versus um hypoxic breathing which a lot of people are probably familiar with where you're taking deep inhales and taking very um shallow exhales and you're not breathing off your co2 it's almost the opposite of something like a wim hof protocol mm -hmm. 
And what, what do those different approaches have as an effect? And what, what does the difference have to be between the inhale and the exhale for it to be kind of significant? Is it like a, you want a, a six second exhale and then a three th second inhale, kind of a two to one ratio? How, how, do, you, how do you organize that? So I like to think about it both in terms of time, but also volume, because you can imagine someone you're like, take a six second inhale in a three second exhale, and they take this huge long inhale and they take a three second exhale, but instead of being a full exhalation in three seconds, they just do half of the volume of the inhale. Mm -hmm. So I'll typically cue people both in terms of time per breath and also volume. So people would know, okay, you're doing a six second inhale and a three second exhale, but you're still exhaling the same volume in that three seconds. So it's very forced. Um, so there's different ways of manipulating it like that. I remember um, Aaron Davis talking about some CO2 protocols that he was using with, with, with his athletes. He talked about altitude mask and how he might recommend someone wear it actually at home when they're not doing anything between training sessions. Have you played with any of that? Uh, no, I haven't played with that too much. Yeah, I tend to uh, probably get a different demographic, um, just knowing the kind of people Aaron works with, where a lot of the people that I work with, they are already very CO2 tolerant because they're CrossFitters who do a ton of uh, what we would traditionally call anaerobic work. Obviously, it's not anaerobic. So I've seen things like that being detrimental in those populations, but I could see mm. something like that being really effective with endurance athletes, gen pop clients, things like that. Yeah, so maybe let's go into that just a little bit because you've, you've made a video on uh, nasal breathing and talked about why maybe for mostly, like you said, the population you work with, CrossFitters, that might not be the best thing to do because they're already very CO2 tolerant. Uh, so in which specific cases might it be a good idea to include some, for example, nasal breathing on some long steady state cardio uh, in training for? Yes, yeah, so I think the people that I'd use that with, one is going to be people that have trouble with maintaining proper breathing mechanics because nasal breathing is reflexively tied to diaphragmatic breathing. So it's a really easy way to cue proper breathing mechanics. Um, people with allergies, asthma, that will be effective as well. And also a lot of the endurance athletes that I work with. I work with some ultra marathoners who don't really do a lot of high intensity work. Mm. So something that could increase their CO2 tolerance will be effective for them because they're not doing this hit training or work where they're getting extended desaturation, having to deal with um, breathing off excess CO2. Um, also with uh, like military populations who tend to do more of that longer volume work with less intensity i'll use that as well mm. but it's not something i typically use with a lot of crossfitters just because i find that they already um under breathe in most instances so they're already getting an excess buildup of co2 so we actually want them to breathe more and breathe greater volumes uh, to continue on that uh, kind of devil's advocate or maybe the cases that there is a good use for it could you talk about specific situations where you might recommend VO2 max testing, lactate testing, and where those might actually come into play, even though we have kind of different means now to get to the answers that we're after. But is there still cases where we might want to use those? Yeah, so starting with lactate testing, the funny thing about that is it works, just not for the reason that we think it does. Like the people traditionally use lactate testing, they would get these measurements, they had base training off of it, and they would actually get good results in the training. So it is effective, just not for the reason that people thought it was effective. So the reason I don't typically use lactate is one, it's very invasive. You're taking blood samples with people and it hurts to get stabbed with little needles. And it's also quite expensive. Um, a mm -hmm. lactate meter, a good one, actually costs just as much as a NIRS monitor or a MOXI monitor. In reality, when you kind of question people, why do you use lactate? What are you trying to get from a lactate meter? you're trying to understand oxygen kinetics. So if mm. you could understand oxygen kinetics for the same price, non-invasively, why wouldn't you just do that? But then VO2 testing takes on a little bit of a different role to me. So for me with VO2 max testing, I don't actually care about the total value that someone gets from it. So VO2 max is measured in milliliters per kilogram of oxygen consumed per minute. And that's a useful measurement because if we think about it intuitively, well, milliliters per kilogram of oxygen consumed per minute, what could limit total oxygen consumed? It could be quite literally your ability to metabolize oxygen in the skeletal muscle. That would be a utilization limitation. 
or maybe if oxygen gets to your skeletal muscle or the end user, it's able to be metabolized, but you can't deliver it as effectively. Mm-hmm. So what VO2 max testing becomes really useful for to me is trying to identify someone's limiter and then using VO2 max testing as a checkpoint. So if I have an athlete and I put them through a MOXIE assessment, or even if I don't have a MOXIE or they don't have a MOXIE, and we use speed preservation testing and we identify their limiter, then I give them training for X period of time to try and address that limiter. If their limiter improves, their VO2 max will improve because your limiter is what constrains your VO2 max. So that's a useful test because most people have access to VO2 testing. If they live near a university, they could usually pay a grad school student like $15 to do it. So even if they're one of my remote clients, we'll have them get a test on. We'll put them through training and then we'll get a retest on and we'll see if their value improved. And if so, we know we identified limiters correctly. So mm-hmm. I don't think things like NEARS eliminate the use for something like VO2 max testing. I think it it's actually additive. I think they're really useful complementary technologies. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You, you mentioned speed preservation testing. Um, I think the, the recent um, segment that, that you added to the one of the presentations that I put up was really helpful for that because it gives a means for people that don't have access to Moxie to potentially determine their the limiters. I've had a few questions around that, um, most notably around swimming. Uh, so, you know, how, how can we use this with swimmers uh, and, and how do we need to adjust the distances? So uh, what would be your recommendation in a case like that for, for a water, a water sport but rather than on a bike or, or on a rower? So, one, I think we, I don't really know enough about swimming. So if you told me like, hey, this is good 100 meter time, I would have no idea if it's mm-hmm. actually good or not. But assuming there's commonly raced distances, because we need a lot of data for each of these. And rowing, 1K, 2K, 3K, 5K, mm-hmm. pretty easy to get data on. Running 800 meter, mile, two mile, 5K, these are all of the distances that are typically raced. I don't know what those distances are for swimming. So let's pretend it's 100 meter, 200 meter, 400 and 800. I might completely be making that up. Assuming that is the case. Now we go into the publicly accessible databases for those distances. And we find athletes at varying levels that have raced all of those different distances. And mm-hmm. we calculate their speed preservation at all of those different distances. So now we could build up a database to know, okay, on average, if we have a thousand athletes that have done the 100, 200, 400, 800, calculate their 100 to 200 speed preservation for all of them. They're two to four, they're four to eight, they're one to four. And we'll see that they end up falling into categories. So we could maybe delineate it between maybe five avatars or seven or 10. Mm. We could kind of bucket people. So then over time, if you get enough data, if you have one of your athletes, you could compare them to that large data set and see what speed preservation curve they line up the closest to. The reason that I use a seven tier speed preservation curve is because I've tried to line it up with the limitation based training model Mm. where we have like delivery, respiratory utilization, and then two between types with each of those, like I talked about in that talk, Mm. but it could have easily been a five or 10 tier speed preservation curve for rowing or running as well. I just chose to use that because it lines up and I can use it as a proxy for what I would get with an ears test. Right. So you were able to do some tests on people and do the speed preservation and see what actually matched up between them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would that need to be done again for the swimming specifically because we, or, or could, could people use the ratios that you outlined in the, in the presentation itself? Um, I don't, maybe they could be, I just can't say with any degree of accuracy that it would actually be reflective of their limitation because I just don't have that much data on swimmers. Yeah. Um, I actually have a buddy right now as part of his PhD um, thesis and project. He's doing nearest testing on swimmers okay. to try and determine limitations. So maybe that starts like a trend where swimmers start using the technology and we could get more data over time, but mm. I don't have anything conclusive right now. I don't really work with swimmers. So um, another thing that I've been looking into more recently is the oxygen conforming response. And so how, can you talk a little bit about what it is and then how solid it is the, the literature on that uh, idea? So I haven't seen a crazy amount of literature on that topic, but there's definitely a few solid papers that have come out in the past three or five years. The general basic idea behind the oxygen conforming response is that as blood is restricted to a muscle and oxygen desaturates within that muscle, 
there will be a matching um, increase in amplitude on an EMG. So essentially the idea is if you restrict blood to a muscle and you perform continuous work, oxygen will go down is the amplitude on an EMG will go up, indicating that uh, neuromuscular activity is increasing as oxygen is decreasing in the tissue, which makes sense in light of um, how we'd think about hypertrophy training, for example. If you're repping out a weight to failure, you're going to be desaturating oxygen in that tissue. You're going to cause peripheral muscle fatigue, which is going to increase motor unit recruitment and mechanical tension. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, we would see that increase in motor unit recruitment being picked up on the SEMG. Yeah. So is it is it right to say that as oxygen levels go down in the muscle that you're soliciting, you're going to essentially compensate by recruiting more in order to, because you still have to produce the same force in order to move the weight. Uh, but if you have less oxygen available, it, do you, is it then resorting to more of a neural kind of um, approach, let's say, to, to, to lifting that weight instead of using the, maybe the, the bioenergetic machinery? Is that, would that make sense? Uh, I think the way that I'd cash it is that as you are fatiguing the muscle, because we're going to be interfering with like, basically if you're desaturating the tissue, you're not going to be able to resequester calcium. Mm -hmm. So you're going to need more muscle fibers being recruited to produce a given unit of work. And that's why we would be getting more motor unit recruitment. So I think mm -hmm. it's like, we can't really separate the energetics and the motor unit recruitment because they're essentially the same mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, does that make sense? Yeah. So is it that when, if there's not enough O2 to, let's say, reestablish the ready state of the cell, as Aaron might say, uh, then you might need to go to other fibers that were not recruited in the first place because uh, you didn't need them under normal oxygen circumstances. But now in that low oxygen environments, is it essentially that, let's say, there's, there's let's say there's 10 uh, fibers and five have been five have used up what they could in terms of their capacity to uh, regenerate some, some ATP through their different processes. But now there's not enough O2 around to get those cells back to ready state. So we need to outsource and go to other ones that we wouldn't have recruited otherwise to do the work. Yeah. And when we're getting into the ready state theory, now we're getting into like sodium and potassium pumps. And I don't know how comfortable I am making like mechanistic jumps, um, with things like that. So yeah, I, I don't have a specific comment with um, that in particular, but one of the things that I would think about is, well, as you're fatiguing fibers, a given work output, so you're lifting a fixed load for a fixed mm -hmm. distance, mm -hmm. you're gonna be required to produce a greater percentage of your maximum voluntary contraction for that same unit of work. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you're gonna need more cross bridges to form. And that would also be why you like start grinding reps as you get closer to failure. So if we're repping out the same load, your reps are gonna get slower and more cross bridges are gonna be forming as you're producing a higher percentage of your maximum voluntary contraction. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you are also restricting progressively greater levels of blood getting to that muscle as you're producing a greater force of contraction and you're going to be desaturating as well. So this is where we get into, like, do these things correlate? Like does oxygen desaturation, motor unit recruitment, are those cor correlative or is that causative? Like mm -hmm. is that decrease in O2 causing that increase in motor unit recruitment? I don't know if that's really been parsed out yet. So I'm always very um, hesitant to get too deep into mechanisms because I think these things are so poorly understood and i think one of the major limitations is not only the literature that's been um published but also just the technology that we could measure these things with like mm -hmm. if we were having this conversation 30 years ago and you asked me about lactate i could have had the most evidence-based response based on all the literature available and i just would have been wrong because mm -hmm. we couldn't have measured these things so i'm always very hesitant to get too deep into details with things like that because i think uh it's a very slippery slope now that that makes sense. What can you imagine any kinds of uh, studies that could be carried out in order to maybe shed some more light on that? Or maybe what could we get out of understanding this oxygen conforming response better? What are the, its practical implications, if any? Yes, I, I think by virtue of these things correlating so tightly, I don't know how you would separate those two variables from each other. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine a scenario where we're keeping oxygen stable to the muscle 
but still bringing it close to failure to see if we're getting an increase in motor unit recruitment because mm. oxygen delivery and work that you could perform are so tightly coupled to one another. Yeah. So I don't know how those two things would jive. I wonder what would be really interesting is if we had someone that was utilization limited. So whether that's due to muscle damage or lack of mitochondrial density, and we had them perform a set to failure where we know oxygen's not going to be desaturated to a meaningful degree. Mm -hmm. If we had an EMG on them, would they elicit like a high spike on the EMG close to that point of failure? Or would it stay fairly even? I think something like that could help elucidate these mechanisms. But now that's getting into like recruitment criteria of, hey, we need to somehow get 50 people to get into the lab to get tested. Yeah. And then out of these 50 people, we have to hope enough of them are utilization limited to right. test this. Then out of that small group of people, now we have to look at the mechanisms and now we can't really calculate statistics because we have three people. Right. I think there's just a lot of steps. And I think exercise physiology as a science doesn't lend itself very well to these types of studies outside yeah. of private sector. But I think mm -hmm. in the private sector, we're probably not going to find people that care about that specific question. So when you mentioned, uh, you know, finding the limiters, we've talked about this at length in, in other videos. Uh, is there any athletes that might not benefit at all from determining their, 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 you know, physiological limiters, depending on maybe the nature of their sport? So who is it not applicable to in, in essence? Yeah, I think a sport that is very highly dictated by a skill component probably won't be that applicable. Like the other day I was talking to a friend of mine, he's a grappler. Yeah. And obviously grappling is a very physical sport, but it's also very technical. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we were talking about is, I was like, hey, if we have a guy who has been grappling since he's five years old, not very fit, like if he were to run a mile, he might run a eight or nine minute mile and you're a very fit guy, do you think you could beat him? He's like, no, they would strangle me in a minute. It's like, okay, well, if skill is that big of a determining factor that you could have a really fit athlete, but they'll just get mangled by someone who's not traditionally in good shape, but is in very good sport-specific shape, hmm. understanding a limiter probably won't be that important unless two people are very equal skill. Because now imagine if we have two guys that are – 30 years old and have been grappling since they're five years old and one of them has also been lifting weights and running for those 25 years and the other hasn't mm -hmm. i think that's going to give us a clear determiner so i think even when we're getting into specific sports it's like well what level are you competing at um who are your opponents because if you're a beginner grappler and you're wrestling a skilled master they're going to strangle you no matter how fit you are mm -hmm. but if you're at an equal level to them then fitness will actually play a determining factor so i think we almost need to do like a needs analysis sport by sport and person by person. Cause I could think of tons of sports where there's not a very clear reason why someone would enlisted a physiological limiter, but if we mm -hmm. have two people with very equal skill levels, maybe it becomes more important in that case. Right. So the skill part is really interesting because I guess even in a very quote unquote energetic sport, like uh, rowing, for example, or erging indoor rowing um, technique still plays a massive role. And whether you, you know, you row properly or not. And then there's, we can go into the weeds and what is properly and, and what is not. Um, but that would make a huge difference too on uh, what muscles you're going to be soliciting and maybe what you display as a limiter first. So maybe as a caveat for, you know, people that do want those to do those speed preservation tests, they need to be highly proficient at the movement before starting those tests. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And that actually ties into something that was quite funny. I was working with a CrossFit athlete who was pretty high level, like a mid-tier sanctional level. Mm. And when we first went through our initial coaching consult, they're like, man, whatever I do with my rowing, like my quads always blow up. Like I'm definitely delivery limited. I was like, okay, well, we'll put you through some testing. And I was like, send me a video of rowing. And they were basically doing like a leg extension on the rower or like a leg <laughs> press rather. And I was like, well, your quads are blowing up because you're literally rowing like you're on a sled of a leg press. So it's probably not that you're delivery limited, just yeah. that you're leg pressing the rower. So I think that factors in. And even in a sport like soccer or football everywhere else in the world because Americans are backward, um, like that is a very energetic sport. But I'm sure if we took a bunch of four-minute milers and threw them into a football game, they're probably not going to do that well, even against like 15-year-olds that have been playing soccer. Right. But if we have a bunch of football or soccer athletes that have been playing their whole lives and are all equally skilled, then your ability to ventilate, your ability to deliver oxygen is going to be increasingly more important at that level of the game.
Mm-hmm. How much, how much have you seen running technique impact uh, energetic demands on on a given athlete? Man, running technique is a tricky one because it's like, well, how do we know what good technique is? Um, and it sounds like a really silly question. Like, of course, there's such thing as good technique. But if we look at a lot of the science on um, movements and people settling into proper technique for their body and the ability to self-organize in, generate an efficient movement pattern, a lot of times what you would think is picture-perfect technique isn't actually appropriate technique for an individual. So if you watch really high-level runners, a lot of them have weird idiosyncrasies in their strides. They'll like do something weird with their foot during the swing phase. They'll do something like kind of funky with their hands. Mm. And you would think that that's not proper technique, but a lot of these athletes, when they try and correct those idiosyncrasies that they've developed over the years, they actually end up getting injured um, because they've settled into these movement patterns. So it's always so tricky to say like, well, what is good technique? What's appropriate technique? Because it's so individualized for the person and I don't necessarily think that we could spot these things visually. So it would be very hard unless someone blatantly like they're running and you're like, you're karate chopping yourself in the neck when you're running. Like that's, that's not appropriate. What is the, for you, what are the two or three most kind of butchered movements in the, let's say the CrossFit list of common exercises that you, that you see the most often and that could be, you know, some some performance limitation could be addressed by just doing that movement much better. I think the cyclical modalities are probably some of the biggest ones in CrossFit. Like, obviously, like I was just saying, it's hard to spot proper technique, but there are very big faults that a lot of CrossFitters have with the basic cyclical movements, uh, running, rowing, swimming. Um, running a lot of CrossFit athletes have no thoracic rotation so they Mm. run with like these very upright rigid torsos and as a result of that they can't get any thoracic rotation their upper bodies are rigid and they almost have like no arm swing like you watch their forward and backward arm counter movement and they have like two inches of range of motion in either direction and that's definitely going to inhibit their ability to run fast Mm. Um, so that's a big one I think for swimming like kicking development one of my colleagues, Kyle Ruth, he was a really high level swimmer before getting into CrossFit. And because CrossFitters aren't really built like swimmers, most CrossFitters are very bottom heavy. They have very muscular legs. They really need to over kick when they're swimming in a way mm-hmm. that a typical streamlined swimmer might not have to. Right. So there's a lot of nuances that you could tweak on those modalities to make people much better because frankly, they just make things cost way too much. If you could have an athlete running a six minute mile as a crossfitter but they're completely wasted after doing that and then you could clean up their movement and their breathing and have them run a six minute mile and go straight into a metcon mm. that's gonna have huge implications for any event that they do in a competition um something you posted recently on your instagram about uh the super compensation theory mm-hmm. i thought was really interesting because uh i guess one more thing that we find in many most text test textbooks up until today and that maybe don't have as much scientific backing as we as we might think. Um, so along the way, between I guess the energy system model, now you got the super compensation theory. Is there any other ones that to you that that are maybe <clears throat> accepted kind of a priori or de facto by everybody, uh, but that might actually require a bit more investigation? Yes. Yeah, so one of the big ones, and this ties into energy systems a bit, I guess, is VO2 max, just how it's been traditionally conceptualized. Mm-hmm. Um, the prevailing idea, even up until now, is the actual quote is that VO2 max is um, the dominant and deterministic limitation of VO2 max is stroke volume. That line has been repeated over and over again in the literature. And recently, I actually um, published a paper kind of critiquing the traditional view of VO2 max. And when I was doing the research for this paper, I read like a hundred papers in the process. And I kept finding this idea that VO2 is principally determined by stroke volume. And when I finally traced back where this came from, it was from a paper in 1923 from Archibald Hill and um, I think Harley Lupton. And they had made this comment. And in their paper, there were a few things that they stated. They had stated that the arteriovenous oxygen difference is always going to be between 10 and 30% during exercise. 
they'd say that, that arterial oxygen saturation won't change. And as a result, VO2 max has to be determined by cardiac output and stroke volume. Because mm -hmm. if we think of how VO2 max is calculated, it's Q, which is cardiac output times the arterial venous oxygen difference. Mm -hmm. But when you actually read their paper, they never measured any of these things because the technology wasn't available for 50 years after that paper was published. Mm -hmm. So you trace these citations over the years and it's repeated over and over and over again. And people always go back. If they're not citing that 1923 paper directly, they're citing a paper from the 1960s that was citing that 1923 paper. Mm -hmm. And using MOXIE, you could quickly realize that one, the arterial venous oxygen difference is not fixed between 10 and 30% during exercise. Yeah. You could get someone desaturating their muscle down to 0%. You could have someone that can't desat below 50 or 60%. Mm. Additionally, if you put on a pulse oximeter, if you have someone who has a pulmonary limitation, you could see them get down to like 88, 90%. That's not a freakish thing. So we know that that's not fixed either. So already mm. in the math of how we could calculate the VO2 max equation, we could already disprove it. I could run someone through a test right now and show you that there's other things truncating um, that value other than cardiac output. And when we actually look in the literature, there's plenty of evidence that VO2 max isn't limited primarily by stroke volume. But because that prevailing theory existed for so long, that other evidence is just downright rejected. Mm. So what I did in the papers, I went through the history of VO2 max, how it was calculated, where the value came from. I went through all of the literature showing that stroke volume is a limiting factor for VO2 max. But then what I bring up is the idea that, hey, just because stroke volume is a limiter for VO2 max in some scenarios, that doesn't disprove that there can't be other limitations mm -hmm. in other contexts or individuals. So then I present all of the counter evidence, all of the papers showing that pulmonary limitations exist in healthy athletes at sea, at sea level, mm -hmm. all the um, evidence that utilization limitations exist in athletes. There's plenty of papers. And then all the evidence showing that, hey, your pre-training going into a protocol determines how you adapt to that protocol. So the reason that HIT training might work for some athletes and not others isn't because HIT training is marginally effective. It's because it only is specific to some athletes' limitations. Mm -hmm. So then I brought in the idea of NEARS and how that could tie into this idea of VO2 max. So I think that's one of the big ones that I think has traditionally been um, conceptualized in a way that the evidence would suggest otherwise. I'm sure there's plenty of other things like adaptation science, like you mentioned, John Kiley's papers and would be a great place to start with that. And he would actually be a really cool person to have on the podcast. I'll, I'll um, write his, I'll write his name down after. Do, did you get any, any responses to your paper? Any, any pushback, any feedback? So it was actually funny. I got contacted by a lot of um, researchers after publishing that paper and the responses were primarily things like, um, I've been like thinking this for like 20 years and like, this is like awesome. I'm glad you put this out. And I got um, contacted by some researchers in Europe who also work with CrossFit athletes and do NEARS and wanting to like, collaborate with papers. So I haven't had anyone um, give me pushback yet, but I do anticipate that that will happen because I did have some hard critiques of a lot of researchers who are still active. One paper in particular that was published two or three months before my Mm -hmm. paper got published in their paper they actually presented a lot of the evidence against stroke volume being the limiting factor for vo2 max but then without justification they basically just said but all of that's wrong and here's why stroke volume is the primary determinant so in my paper i'd mentioned like how much cognitive dissonance there was and i cited that specific paper so i'm waiting to get some kind of kickback on that but whatever how do you how do you deal with your own ideas being challenged by other people and you know putting things forward that you think are right at the time and then maybe down the road things change technology technology changes uh, theories change and then you have to kind of quietly be okay with not always being right or at least having mm -hmm. some things from the past and maybe even from the present that that don't make sense how do you personally deal with that I mean, the fortunate thing is that I work in an organization at Training Think Tank where everyone likes to argue over ideas. So anytime I propose a new idea, even if like Max or Kyle agree with it, they'll just argue with it for the sake of arguing. And I think it forces all of us to 
one realize when we have ideas that are actually pretty shitty and don't have strong justification, which there have definitely been plenty of those. Um, so I think that's one, like having people that will definitely check you and call you out on stuff and then forcing you to reconsider your own ideas. Like I have plenty of things that I've said years back that I probably don't agree with. And I think that's perfectly fine. I think if you're not learning new things, why even bother doing this? And I think particularly with publishing scientific papers, like a big part of it is anytime you think you have a hunch, you have to intentionally try and find all of the counter evidence. And then you really have to honestly assess the validity. If you find something that contradicts your ideas, it doesn't mean that you have to throw your ideas out right away, but you have to look at the strength of those arguments in comparison to the strength of your own arguments. And if they have like a better hand than you and they have more justification, not only mechanistic, they have um, like double blind placebos, they have RCTs, meta-analyses, and you have some observational research, you're probably the one that's wrong in that scenario. So I think it's also understanding like the hierarchy of evidence um, when you're presenting an idea. Mm -hmm. If we maybe just come out of the academic uh, realm just for a minute and maybe if there is coaches, there are coaches out there who want to take the time to sit down with a few colleagues and exchange ideas. What are some of the maybe strategies that they can employ in order to maybe remain ego free or as ego free as possible in those exchanges and conversations? Is there ways to put things forward? Maybe that you guys use a training think tank that allows for other people to critique without it uh, turning really quickly into kind of ad hominem and pointing fingers and, and critiquing the person that the idea came from rather than the mm -hmm. idea itself. Yeah, I think a big thing is just not forming your identity around any of your ideas. This actually goes back, it was a conversation I had recently with someone where they asked me, like, why don't you ever post anything about nutrition on your social media? Um, they're like, do you just like not like the topic or you just don't research it? And I'm like, no, there's actually a really good reason why I don't post anything about nutrition. Like nutrition is one of the few fields where you don't have need to have any degree of expertise to have an opinion. Like my uncle Phil, who thinks ketchup is a vegetable, he has <laughs> just as much of an opinion as Dr. Ben House, who is a PhD in nutrition because the dude has his 10,000 hours of eating under his belt, so obviously he knows about food. Where topics like NEARS or physiology, they're not as vindictive because there's a level of expertise that you need to interpret these things. And I think this goes to a deeper issue, which is things like politics, nutrition. The reason why there's like camps and divisiveness is that people form identities around these things so if you like a paleo diet or a vegan diet or a keto or a carnivore it's not just the way you eat like that becomes part of you like i identify as a vegan or i identify as the carnivore so if you attack this style of eating you're personally attacking me and that's not really a great way to think when we're in the marketplace of ideas like i have a dog i'm sure if we had enough nutrition science on the proper canine diet, we could come to a conclusion because no one dictates their identity by what they think is the best food to feed a dog, but they think about them for themselves. So I think the more things you tie your identity to, the dumber you are as a person because you can't actually see contradicting evidence becomes it, because it becomes an attack on you, like you're partisan by default. So I think a big thing is like, if you're a coach, like don't form your identity around a training concept. Like I actually put up a post about it today. Don't say like, I'm a high volume coach. I'm a high intensity coach. Like I'm a conjugate style coach because then that becomes your one thing. And when that one thing doesn't work, you don't really have any other tools. So instead like coach the athlete, not coach the system. So mm -hmm. if I present an idea at a staff meeting and everyone rips it apart, I'm not like personally attacked because that idea is such a big part of my identity and I can't live without it. It's like, oh, that was just an idea I had. I'll have plenty of other ideas. They might be just as shitty or they might be really good, but none of them really say anything about me. Do you maybe transitioning on that, that post that you posted today on coaching systems. And I guess it, it also, it could be called belief systems around coaching if, if we push it a little farther, but um, have you always been able to, dissociate yourself from the systems and methods that you used or was there a time where young Evan was very emotionally attached to what he was doing and, and why and with who etc I think the honest answer is that when I was a younger coach I didn't actually have a system to begin with so there's nothing to be <laughs> attached to um, and, yes and, and where why do you think 
that people attach themselves to, to ways of thinking, ways of doing things? Is it, is it a comfort thing? Is it that there's so much unknown that if you do somewhat understand some aspect of it, you, you're just going to hang on for dear life? Because if you let go of this, then what you, you really, you're in a kind of a sea of, of unknowns with maybe dots of clarity here and there. Yeah, I think it could be a few things. I think one, like human beings hate ambiguity. So anything that you could do to eliminate ambiguity is going to be beneficial for you and your ego. So if you have one thing, you could ignore all contrary evidence. And that's very comfortable. You don't mm -hmm. have to confront that. Um, I think another thing is wanting to be part of a tribe. Like if you're a keto lover or a vegan or a carnivore, you could bond and vibe with all the other carnivores or keto people mm -hmm. um so i think that's a big part of it as well and i think that lends itself well to creating like factions and identities like if we think back to early crossfit the community is not really like this any much as more because they let in so many other people but crossfit used to be very divisive as well and i mean all sex of fitness kind of used to be very divisive like when i first got into um after i transitioned out of running and i got into crossfit it was like oh power lifters hate crossfitters crossfitters hate bodybuilders weightlifters hate everyone and like it was this really <laughs> divisive thing but i think one of the things that crossfit did really well over the years is like letting everyone in and saying like okay well we do crossfit and we like weightlifting so let's invite all the weightlifters to come in and tell us all the things that they know and invite all the power lifters and the running coaches and it kind of breaks down these identities where you own people don't even identify as anything anymore. It's more of just like, Hey, I like to train. And because I like to train, if you like to train, let's hang out together, even though we don't like training in the same way. So I think the more we could like break down these barriers and make the circle of us bigger. So there's less them that's just better for everyone and sharing ideas. Can you think of any disciplines that are maybe blatantly missing from the CrossFit well-rounded model of fitness things that you you think of are like that that should really be part of what we do as a whole if we really want to be you know good generalists yeah i think this is where we get into the idea of like crossfit as a sport versus a fitness uh discipline if you want to call it that mm -hmm. i think people that do crossfit competitively are actually missing a lot of things for well-rounded fitness one of the things that i found is the more specialized you become in crossfit typically the less athletic you become. Hmm. Um, so you'll not be as good at sprinting, jumping, cutting, like everything in CrossFit is completely sagittalized. So you're probably not good at anything with a rotational component, nothing with a throwing component, a spreading component, like cutting component. All of those things are completely lacking. Hmm. There's no um, hand-eye coordination components in CrossFit. So I think if we wanted to say like broad general fitness includes everything, it's certainly missing. Um, but at the same time, like to what avail are we going after like broad general fitness? Like I know everyone loves this idea of being able to do everything, mm -hmm. but I think what people really actually like the idea of is being able to lift heavy things and look jacked like a bodybuilder be able to do cool gymnastics tricks, also being enduring. And I think when most people go for those things as broad fitness, they're intentionally leaving a lot of other things out because if you want to be really jacked, strong, enduring, like you're probably not going to spend that much time juggling or having hand-eye coordination or doing rotational work. So I think it gets into like a issue of classification and nomenclature mm -hmm. um, more than anything. Like even a decathlete, you're like, oh, they're really fit. They could do a ton of different stuff, but there's so many things missing from their sport. They don't lift anything heavy. Right. Um, maybe transitioning, I've got a couple audience questions for you, Evan. So we're going to move on to those. Um, Brian asks, how much strength volume is enough to maintain strength while trying to improve Metcon? Yes. So it depends, I guess, how we're defining strength and how we're defining improving Metcon. So I think that's largely depend on like what those things mean, but assuming you're like, oh, I want to maintain my Olympic lifting and my squatting, I'm guessing he's a CrossFitter who wants to get stronger. Mm -hmm. Man, if he's someone that has trouble improving his um, Metcon ability or his work capacity, and he's someone that tends to get better at retaining strength or getting stronger, the volume is typically quite low. You could maintain strength with really minimum volume, anywhere between like 20 and 40% of what it took you to build your strength levels if you're someone that retains well. Mm -hmm. 
but that's obviously going to factor into how much volume are you doing with the engine work. So I think what I would tend to tell people if they want to make that split, like retaining strength, getting back at better at their capacity, make minor adjustments to start. Maybe reduce your strength volume by 5 to 10%, increase your Metcon volume by 5 to 10%, or even better than redu increasing your volume there, just make it more specific to what your limitations are. Mm. So if you're doing 10 hours a week of conditioning work, maybe identify, well, what is my actual limiter and how much of that volume is even specific to that limiter? Because it might be that out of those 10 hours, two of those hours are actually making you better at something. Mm -hmm. So I think if we look at things in that way, you don't really need to have big reductions in anything. And you might find that things start moving in the right direction without having to make these huge swings in volume with either of those qualities, but just by changing the composition. Mm -hmm. um, next question I've got from Mikolai who asks, how to increase mitochondrial density, and I'll maybe add a, a follow-up. Why would someone want to increase mitochondrial density? So yeah, the I guess I'll answer the why would you want to increase it first. So one of the reasons that you would want to increase mitochondrial density is to be able to utilize more total oxygen in the tissue, so increasing your magnitude of oxygen utilization, mm -hmm. and also increasing your rate of oxygen utilization, so the speed at which you could utilize, or we could even consider it like the acceleration of utilization. Um, so that's going to be helpful with improving power outputs, re improving repeated sprint ability, improving your... Um, top speed and ability to sustain very high power outputs. In some ways that we could do that would be a repeat sprint training if it's done with an appropriate um, duration and volume. So there's a style of training that I personally like a lot called repeat desaturation training. Mm. It's not like a magical protocol, but it's just a pretty foolproof way of doing it. And it makes it pretty easy to not um, F yourself up with the volume. Mm. So it's essentially a form of training where you're doing 10 to 20 second sprints at a fixed percentage of your max wattage with a fixed rest period and you're repeating that until you elicit some kind of compensation which that compensation could be a change in your mechanics and inability to hit the same power output um your breathing not being able to get back to baseline and then that way you're essentially getting as much volume in as possible as you can on that day without doing too much volume because if you overdose it you could actually be having the opposite training effect if you're getting muscle damage and sub recruitment you won't be getting more mitochondrial density is, is that a, a protocol that is maybe reserved for delivery limited athletes or do you see other types of athletes benefit from it as well yes yeah, so I, I would for repeat um, desaturation, I would probably use that for utilization limited athletes and the repeat gradual desaturation I would primarily use for delivery. Mm -hmm. But I think we could make the argument either way that you could kind of cross pollinate those. Like there might be instances where you would want to deliver limited athletes to improve their utilization mm -hmm. um, because this gets to the idea that you don't fail in a workout when your limiter gives out. You fail in a workout when you run out of all effective compensation strategies. So even mm -hmm. if we know someone has a specific limiter, we still need to improve everything else as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. We can maybe uh, bounce off on that a little bit because like you said, it's not that your limiter is the sole player in the game of energetics. It has, the, the, the other ones are there as well and they will compensate to, to a fairly large extent in order for you to keep pushing. So just because you're limited by X doesn't mean that you only have to train X. Training the other ones and pushing the other ones will overall still push your performance forward as long as I guess this, you haven't reached the current ceiling for that said system. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a good way of phrasing it. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you was um, we talked about the strength test with the Moxie and how you can find occlusion trends using a Moxie. Have you found any reliable ways of finding that without nearest technology because we now we have the speed preservation for kind of the physiological limiters but what's the equivalent for the strength and the occlusion trends so that's the one that i haven't found any really reliable proxy i think there's things that we can do to get a very ballpark understanding like that traditional nme test that i don't think actually tests for neuromuscular efficiency the mm -hmm. like max reps at 85 percent of your back squat yeah well if you could perform 10 15 reps at 85 percent of your one rep max i still have no idea what percentage of your um one rep max you get venous and arterial occlusion but i could probably assume that it's higher than the 
average population. If you could get like two or three reps at 85%, again, I have no idea what percentages you get those reactions, but I could assume they're much lower than the average population. Mm -hmm. So I think that's at least like a ballpark start where like, hey, you're probably have higher or lower percentages than normal, but there's no way as far as I'm aware of saying like, this is the percentage that you transition from um, compression to venous occlusion or venous occlusion to arterial occlusion. Uh, the, um, let's say the, the gap between uh, an ar uh, venous occlusion and an arterial occlusion um, from the kind of what I've, what I've gathered from the work you've done and what I've seen from the few graphs uh, on, you know, strength assessments with NEARS, uh, it looks like that, that gap between the two is usually pretty steady, but then it moves up and down. Have you seen big variations sometimes with a very, maybe a very narrow gap where somebody would occlude venously and they would have kind of a bigger proportion compared to, uh, let's say, average or what we usually see or what we usually talk about. They would have a lot compression up to a very high percentage, but then they would also start arterially occluding very early compared to maybe that, that standard um, avatar, if that makes sense. So do you mean if someone were to get compression from like zero to 50 and then venous from like 50 to 70 and then yeah. get arterial 70 plus? Yeah. Um, I mean, I have seen some people bigger or smaller windows than others, but I haven't seen anything that extreme where it's like you get compression up to 50 and then you include your artery at 70 or where you see someone and you're like, you get venous occlusion at 20% of your one rep max, but you get venous up until 85 before you quit the artery. I haven't really seen anything like that. Um, right. it, perhaps, I think it's possible that could exist. I just haven't seen that. And then would there be a way of correlating where you are in terms of occlusion trends with how you feel when doing a certain uh, percentage of RM effort? I mean, I think if you're getting like a really mean muscle pump, you're probably at least getting venous occlusion or early into an arterial occlusion. Mm -hmm. um, but outside of that, I, I don't think so. And that becomes so difficult to assess because it's like, well, does that mean you're at 30% of a max voluntary contraction or mm -hmm. 90%? Right. I think it just becomes very messy using subjective markers because... I don't think most people could feel when they transition from like compression to venous because it's not going to be like a full venous occlusion where you're getting like a gnarly pump. I think for most people that would probably happen like mid to late um, in that window. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, it's more of a spectrum than kind of a, a hard, fast limit between one and the other. Yeah, for sure. Right. So I guess we'll, we'll leave that question for you to answer in the coming months or the coming years. Uh, I've got a few rapid fire questions for you here to to just finish the chat. So try to answer them as short as you can. Um, first one, a book you're reading right now. A uh, book I'm reading right now is, I'm actually only reading one book right now because I'm moving and I don't have access to anything else. It's called, What is the What? Has nothing to do with training whatsoever. Um, it's actually about the civil war in Sudan and it's really depressing. <laughs> <laughs> would you recommend it? Uh, yeah, I would recommend it. Um, but just don't go into it thinking you're going to learn anything about science or training. Uh, maybe a little aside question on that. How important is it for you to read outside of training? And because you're obviously, you know, passionate about what you do and you, you love researching and you love trying things and learning things, but you still take the time to go outside. Is it to change your mind? Is it because you actually see it as complementary to what you do? Um, yeah, I think a little bit of both. To be honest, I don't read really any training books. I, I read like a lot of research, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but when I'm just reading for pleasure or reading other science books, I like to get outside of training books for a few reasons. One, I don't want to be thinking about training all day. Um, I also find that some of my best training related ideas have come from books that aren't about training at all. Um, and I think when you talk to a lot of scientists, that seems to be true. One of the things that was pretty influential to me like 10 or so years ago is I was reading um, a biography about Charles Darwin and mm -hmm. like everyone knows him as a biologist and a naturalist, but it was talking about his reading habits. And he, for whatever reason, I don't know what kind of sociopath does this. He wrote down in a notebook every book he'd ever read in the order that he read them, which is really weird thing to do. Um, and what they found is he spent years reading a lot of things in his field, 
Right. But then he would spend like a year or two only reading things in this completely unrelated discipline. But then he would come back to his core competencies and spend some time there. And then he would read a ton of things in a completely unrelated discipline and then come back to his core competencies. So what it seemed like he was doing was going into other fields and finding the principles and distilling them and bringing them back to his core competencies. Mm. And I find that that's what a lot of scientists end up doing. And I think that's the virtue of like uh, interdisciplinary sciences. So being interested in things outside of your direct discipline. So I think we get stagnant with ideas. And I think the only way to really bring something new to what you do in your profession is to take ideas from completely unrelated places because I think a lot of methods and a lot of principles are actually very generalizable. So if you read a few economics textbooks or a few um, ecology books, I think you're actually going to find a lot of really good training principles in those books that you might have not thought of if you only read training books. What's a research paper that you read recently that kind of stayed on your mind or kind of marked you a little bit? Uh, the most recent one that I read that I was like, God, I need to spend more time reading is the lactate of the fulcrum of metabolism one from uh, George Brooks. That mm -hmm. one, one it took forever to read, to be completely honest. Um, but that was a really good one. It made me want to spend a lot of time reading other things. Um, with my research, that one, I don't read like a lot of very uh, fun things per se because I basically cater that to what I'm looking at at any given period of time mm -hmm. like I just collect research papers all the time and I don't read most of them until I have a reason to mm -hmm. so I've been working on writing a paper recently related to critical power and oxygen delivery so 90% mm -hmm. of what I read on the research side is either about critical power or about oxygen delivery Right. So it's like at this point, it's just very repetitive. You find the same things popping up over and over again. But occasionally when I'm like between projects, I'll just look for research on random things that I think might be cool. And occasionally you find some really awesome stuff. In what you're reading right now about critical power and oxygen delivery, is there anything that you, that you learned through you reading those papers that, um, that surprised you maybe? Or is it all pretty in line with each other? Um, during this process, there's nothing too surprising. I had done a lot of research prior to beginning this, and it's a topic that I've been familiar with for a few years now, but um, I just never wanted to take the time to really dig into it. I have like a weird thing where if something's like a huge rabbit hole, I need to be like mentally ready to go there. That was kind of the VO2 max literature. Yeah. I like didn't really want to dive full in because so I was like, I don't really want to write a paper. I honestly don't really like doing that but then once I decide to I'm like okay I'm going to dedicate the next month to this um, and now I'm kind of doing the same thing with critical power so after this I don't know what the next thing I'm going to be researching is but I'll probably just read random papers for a few months and not write anything what's a band you're playing right now a band like a uh, music band music band yeah uh the one I've been listening to a lot right now is a band called knocked loose they're a metalcore band yeah We'll, uh, we'll link that below. And then last one, a movie or TV show you watched recently that you would recommend? I watched uh, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets last night. Would definitely recommend. <laughs> Absolutely. So for all the people that have missed that one, definitely go watch it. Um, Evan, for people that don't follow you yet, somehow after listening to you for all four episodes that you've been on now, where can people find you? Um, best place would be Instagram, Evan, E-V-A-N underscore PyCon, which is P-E-I-K-O-N. That's where I post 90% of my content. Um, you could also find me at trainingthinktank.com or emergentperformancelab.net. Fantastic. As usual, those will be linked in the description. Evan, thanks again for taking the time to come on today. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Yeah, thank you for having me again. All right. See you next time. Uh, later. Mm -hmm.